Tuner on the podcast and the live stream, your Fiverr with the drivers on Sirius XM, no matter how you're tuning in today. Thanks for starting the week off with us. You having a good one? Did y'all get it done this weekend? I uh, I told you before I left the show, it's going to the lookouts. They um they have an alternate team this year. They're paying tribute or homage to the rich towing history of Chattanooga. So their alternate team name is the Wreckers. So I got it here. Go predatory towing. Go dad of two roadside. I kid, I kid. It was a really, really nice time. Go check out the stadium, get some of this stuff. But what else we did over the weekend is we picked up some e-bikes and we also stopped at this place called Ollie's. Now, Ollie's, if you've never been, occupies a very interesting corner of the supply chain. They get all the overstocks. They get everything that can't be sold. So I don't know if this is a good sign because only $19.99 at Ollie's, you could get the Rand McNally Motor Carrier's Guide. Now, granted, this is a 2023, not a 2024. If you're in the market for one, go stop by. Not going to get a better deal. It's 80 bucks. Now, I don't know. The roads, it's been a year. It is a 2023, not a 2024. So there may have been some changes. Obviously, there's not some things that are are still standing. Um, Here's a little fact on them, though, because I got curious when I was reading this. And we did have uh, Rand McNally on the show before. They're coming back again soon. Shout out to you guys. They're going to send me a 2024. But did you know that Rand McNally published their first road atlas? Actually, the 100-year anniversary is in 19... 19- 24. But did you also know that William Rand and Andrew McNally got their start making railroad maps before they made trucks? In fact, both of the founders died 20 years before Rand McNally ever even made a road atlas. Do you have one in your truck? Smoking Monkey says, funny story. Years ago at the TA in Terrell, Texas, the ta- the cashier was giving these away because she thought they were free. On the cover, it said in big letters with smaller ones under it that uh, it said map updates. I told her they ain't free. And she was like, oh my God, I've already given away 30 of these guides. Yeah, I think it's like an $80 list price on that thing. That's why that 20 bucks is such a good deal. Tony, the truck driver, he brings up a good point. And this is kind of embarrassing for those of us that are aging. He said, do they have the larger print? ones for us old timers i'm not sure i can grab a spyglass on the cheap one as well i know the feel i'm getting to the point where i gotta you know take the cell phone and take a picture of the back of the aspirin and uh zoom in to actually see what that thing says or have like my kid read it to me i remember being a kid and having to do that for my parents and thinking how old they are well i'm there now jason said what percentage of new truckers know how to even use one of those less than five percent i'm not really sure left hand grandpa every truck should be given a test on how to use a road atlas we would be posting much fewer videos of semi trucks hitting bridges if that were the case danny masterson says it's the best investment he's ever made and sean wilkie said good stuff cheap seriously though when i was a kid i would look at a trucker's atlas for hours multiple days of the week during the summer u.s geography was the only class i would ace in school. Very cool. Yeah, we'll have Rand back. All right, kind of a serious story here. Uh, The unwinding, Tony's Express, they went out of business at the end of March. Uh, March 28th was the big bad day for them, but now Tony Express workers, um, the drivers over there are saying mismanagement sank the company. Clarissa Haas, she's got the full story on Freightways.com. Check it out. But basically, as I just said, the employees over there, it's a 70-year-old trucking company, a gentleman named John Oley. He came in here. He bought the place. And in about a year's time, the uh, that was it for them. Tony shut down. It was on the 28th. And uh, John Oley, he'd sent out. This is the weird part of that week. On the 24th of that week, he sent out a text to employees, the entire company. He said, uh, we got an insurance issue. No trucks tomorrow. This is going to get resolved. Well, by the 28th, it hadn't got resolved. The company had shut down. The employees had never Never got back. And two weeks later, two weeks after the shutdown, Ole has yet to pay his drivers, warehouse workers, and dock workers, and the office personnel as well, their final checks for their paid time off. That's going to sources at Freightways. Some are owed multiple checks after previous paychecks bounced. Their medical coverage ended two days before the company even shut down. So they're going to have to get into, I don't know, maybe expensive stuff like Cobra. Um, they're going to have to talk to some people. Ole, he said to Freightways, the current market just didn't support our ability to operate and be a profitable company. And the cost of fuel in California made it very, very difficult. Now, a little bit more on that came from a source to Freightways. Um, They said that Tony's Express had a recourse agreement with the factoring company E-Capital. When E-Capital was unable to collect on those invoices, which amounted to hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, Tony's was forced to buy back around $300,000 of these uncollected invoices. 
a former driver over there, a less than truckload driver, he says, besides not getting paid for two weeks before we close, my fuel card wouldn't work at times. And John Ole was one of his managers. He asked me to use my personal debit card to pay for fuel, which would have cost me hundreds of dollars. Yeah, don't do this. If a company's going out of business, they tell you to get the fuel. Do not do that. Run away. They don't have money to pay you. You'll be on the hook. Definitely do not get that fuel. Um, another issue that came out is a, another ex-employee. He said that the group there, and maybe this is why the executives taught, thought it was okay to tell the employees to use their own money. Apparently, the executives over there started paying com data checks with their own debit cards. This is how bad the finances go. Another employee said it's such a shame that Ole and other managers he brought with him to Tony's Express were able to tear down this beloved company in less than a year when he took it from the Ralu family, 70 years to build and maintain a good reputation in this industry. Unfortunately, too, Tony's had 200 employees, drivers, warehouse, and dock workers over there. Not his first rodeo either. He bought another family-owned trucking company in 2002, and that shut down in less than two years. So, I don't know. I hope everyone ends out okay in this. If you have any jobs for any of these Tony's Express drivers, reach out to them. They're over in that California area. But today, on this show, let's get into it. Who do we got? Oh, wait, hold on. Paula Tavo, you had a good comment. He said, I feel for these folks. It's real tough to lose your job like that. I'm sure the management team will come out of this with money in their pocket, but the people whose backs made this company got screwed. I hope they get paid. A lot of folks are check to check. I was in the same situation as I worked for Yellow Freight, still waiting for the money they owe us. Unfortunately, employees came last. The company only looks for ways to avoid giving the former employees some of the money they do. Am I reading that right? Some of these yellow employees still have not get paid? I got to follow up with Paul over there. All right, on episode 706 of What the Truck, I'm talking to Brush Pass Research, Kevin Hill, my co-host on Put That Coffee Down. Um, he's got some great data here. There's 35% more freight brokers than there were five years ago. You know that big run-up of truck authorities? We're going to talk about the brokerage side, but it's on decline. There's 10% less than there were just one year ago. Put the phone down, driver. It's Distracted Driver Awareness Month. So we got a great guest named Chris Hayes from Travelers. We'll tell some stats and data that you need to know, how it impacts trucking, how it impacts insurance rates. And the Broker Carrier Summit is kicking off in Kansas City. One week from now, we got Troy Wheatonen and Rob McCutcheon here to find out everything we need to know about what's going down in KC. Plus, Tesla Semi sparred in Walmart. We'll get to that later. But right now, we have Chris Hayes here. Chris, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you. How are you doing? I've been doing good. You know, I'm just finding the the, mo the best and most appropriate ways to celebrate this uh, Distracted Driver Awareness Month, uh, bring awareness to it. I'm sure all of us have had the experience of driving down the road, especially truck drivers. You can see in the other person's window and you see people watching movies, typing, texting, a lot of bad stuff going on the road. And you are, but before we get into that, tell people here a little bit what you do at Travelers. So I have a, a very long, big, fancy title, but in <laughs> essence, I uh, work in truck safety for an insurance company. Uh, I've been in trucking safety for 25 years, which is weird to think it's been that long, um, but I've been with Travelers for 22 years working in safety and almost all of it has been in trucking, hence all the trucking stuff around behind me. Well, it, well uh, the no better guest, right? It makes sense. You're the safety guy. It's distracted. Driving Awareness Month. Uh, set the table. Tell us a little bit about what we need to know. Absolutely. So Travelers every year does something we call the risk index. And we go through, look at things that companies find risky, people find risky, and see just how attitudes are changing. Uh, so we do one on the distracted driving uh, that's going on out there. We ask about a thousand individuals and over a thousand people who run safety or risk management for companies. And we ask them how things are going. And we get a sense of whether or not people think risk is going up or going down. So what do you think? Is risk going up or going down out there? Uh, judging by what I've seen, I got to be the passenger on a very long road trip to Louisville um, to go to Matt's, and I got to do a lot of outside the window spying, and I would say it's going way up. Uh, it's pronounced Louisville, but yes, you are absolutely correct. It is going way up. I was, I was taking a walk yesterday, and I had to uh, make sure to not get hit by the person driving a straight truck uh, while staring at their phone driving into a red light. Uh, oh, so wow. it's you and me and everyone else. Um, so we, we ask again, we ask all these people, and most people say that just behind drunk driving, distracted driving is the thing they're most concerned about on the road. 80% uh, of people think that distracted driving has gotten worse in the last couple of years. And this one is kind of scary. 40% of people say they've had a near miss or a crash because of their or someone else's distracted driving. 
Uh, and then on the business side, it certainly has increased attention as well. Uh, almost three quarters of companies now have some level of concern that distracted driving will hurt their company. Wow. You know, Chris, I saw people with Apple Vision Pros getting pulled over when all those videos were going viral a month ago. That's like the last thing we need to add to this. But the good news is the result, it seems like people care, right? So are people willing to, are they ready to take some action here? Well, you know, we like to think as we see stats like this, that people care. Um, and that's not really working out the way we'd, we'd hoped it would. Um, so every year we take a look at what are people doing? What will they admit to during a survey about distracted driving? And every year we see things like shopping while driving, taking videos while driving, updating social media while driving are continuing to increase. So, you know, we say that we care about distracted driving, but it seems that until it actually hits you directly, most people still think it's, oh, it's someone else's problem and, and, and I can do it and it's gonna be okay. Uh, especially in, in the business world, right, we find people to say, oh, well, the conference call is going to be okay. I can listen to that while I'm driving on the road. And you know, the stats prove that that is not necessarily true. Uh, distraction is visual and manual and cognitive. So that long conference call, talking to your dispatcher, getting new directions, um, certainly do add to distraction. Now, when you're saying you surveyed businesses, are you, you're talking about carriers, you're talking about freight brokers? It's a little bit of both. So we talk to carriers, talk to freight brokers, we talk to anyone who's got a, a vehicle on the road. So that could be salespeople, uh, mechanics, your, your cable installer. And you know, you, you've got to think about this in terms of, you know, why is that important to me in trucking? Um, do you really just want to know about your vehicles or do you want to know about the environment around you? So if anyone who's in a truck right now, look around, uh, your truck is a... Um, exception to the cars, to the light trucks, to the cargo vans, to the straight trucks that are on the road. So you've got to think about what your driving is like and how you can impact your driving. Also, the context of everyone else out there. Uh, and I'm sure your audience has all looked down and seen just what you saw, you know, really people not paying attention to their driving, which puts a different kind of pressure on the truck driver to be safe. When you say like distraction, what kind of distractions are we like talking like people updating social media like 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 that while driving a truck watching videos? And so it's it's real range. So we tend to think about distracted driving as just our, our cell phone. Um, and there are certainly things on a, a smartphone that you can do that are distracting. So again, uh, texting is is very common. Uh, email is very common. About half of respondents say that, oh yeah, they've they've answered email and, and wrote a message back or a text back while driving. Um, again, checking your messages is very common. And those somewhat less common things of shopping while driving uh, is is continuing to increase. But there's also the risk of things like, I'm just staring off into space. I'm looking at the billboard. I'm looking down to see if other people are distracted. Fatigue adds up, stress adds up. So you start putting all these things together and just the, the health of the individual driver, how well their mind is focused on the act of driving really is important. Again, that could be just electronic distraction, that could be health, that could be fatigue, that could be mental health. It's really quite a range. All right. So we know the bad news. Let's let's get some good news. Let's get some progress. Let's get let's get some people moving forward. What suggestions do you have during this distracted driving awareness month that we should have people thinking about? What should we make them aware of? Uh, so the first thing to think about is just what it costs to be distracted. Uh, the official stat is there's around 3000 people who die in the United States every year from distracted driving crashes. It's a close to 10 percent of every motor vehicle fatality in the United States. So you do the math, that's close to 40,000 people dying every year for the last couple of years. A good portion of that is from distracted driving. So you do have to ask, is that phone call, is making that order uh, through your app, is updating your social media, is it worth the risk of those people ending their lives? Uh, and I hope the answer is no, I can wait till I'm someplace safe. From a business standpoint, I, I think it's really important, especially for this audience, to think about why, as a dispatcher or a manager, am I calling a driver? You odds are know exactly where they are. You know when they're driving. You know when they're not. You've got ELDs. You've got telematics. You really have a good sense of how everyone's operating. So when you have the impulse to, I'm going to call Dooner and, and let him know that something's changed, 
you can tell that they are driving. You can tell what the situation is. Choose not to call them. And as a driver, it's also important to say, I am driving and I'm not going to answer that call or hit the uh, hit the speaker, say, I'm driving. I'll call you back later and hang up. You know, it, it only takes one misstep. It only takes one glance down, one one you're going down here to put a like on your phone. Next thing you know, you're yeah. right in the back of an RV. Um, it, it, leave us with something here. I've, <laughs> 3,000 should be enough to leave you with. 3,000 yeah. people every year dying of distracted driving crashes. But I'll, I'll end with this. Every drive, whether that's me in my, my little Mazda 3 or you know, anyone out there in an 80,000-pound truck, it's all just a series of micro decisions. How fast am I going? How close is that car in front of me? Is there someone in my blind spot? What's my destination? What's my time? How far am I going? How fast am I going? It's all just constantly churning through your head. You don't realize it, but that is all going through your head all the time. And just that one miss of, I'm going to take just five seconds here to answer this text and then go back to those decisions could be the five seconds that really makes a difference in someone's life. Wow, great stuff. And I'm sure our audience took that heart. We're really glad you joined us today. We hope to have you back in the future. And uh, what's today? Monday. So you have a great week. It's, it's only Monday. Thanks, you too. Thank you. Take care. All right, everybody. Meanwhile, it's the 128th of Boston Marathon, the make way for ducklings, as you see right there. They are all dressed up for this. Like, if, if you're not from Boston, you don't know this, but, but I am. This is a huge event in the city. They have the day off if you're a worker in the city. Everybody goes out and checks things out. Those are the iconic make way for ducklings. Um, it's almost always a great time, except for the time Rosie Ruiz actually jumped on the tee and made her way to the finish line. And obviously, 11 years ago, there was that very unfortunate marathon bombing. My wife and I had actually been living out in the city at that time. We didn't go to the marathon that day. I believe that we both had to, uh, we had to work. We didn't have it off. We didn't have that particular federal or not federal state holiday off. But our teacher, our dance instructor, we were taking wedding dance instructions. And there was a lady named Adrienne Hazlitt Davis. I believe she's even been on Dancing with the Stars, but she was in that crowd. She was getting us ready to dance in our wedding that was coming up in October. And um, she lost her foot and ankle in that in that terrible, terrible attack. Now, I hope it goes awesome out there. You have all these dogs. If you're watching the video version, you saw Golden Strong right there. They are calling tribute back to the fallen that happened during that Boston Marathon bombing. And, of course, bringing the great message along the marathon route. Very cool. Have a good time out there. Be safe. Now, we got Troy Wheaton in with us. He's VP of Business Development at Leonard's Express. And we got Rob McCutcheon, VP of Strategy and Growth over at Tafts. And we're talking about a little event that's coming up. What's up, sir? Man, how are you today? How are you? Do you ever run a marathon? They got a marathon over in, uh, where are you at? Are you in KC or are you from somewhere Listen, else? Yeah, I'm in Farmington, New York, Rochester, New York. And you know what? I would definitely not run a marathon. Uh, you can see me from the head up, but uh, there is nothing about this that says I should be running anywhere. Well, actually, there's a lot of things that say I should be running. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that can you can tell that I don't. How about that? <laughs> of course. Well, and you've got a friend with you here today, Mr. Rob. What's going on, sir? Hey, Tim. How are you doing? Introduce yourself to this lovely audience. Well, what's like that 20-second elevator pitch on you as a human being? <laughs> yeah, well, Rob McCutcheon, VP Strategy and Growth over here at Tafts. Uh, been with the company for about eight years. Uh, again, really excited about Broker Carrier Summit and uh, got to know Dan and Trey and all those guys uh, that are running this event several years ago at, at TIA where a lot of people just came back from and uh, really excited about it. Very cool. I think we have a flyer. Guys, we got an image here. When is when's the event coming up? I think it's only like a week away, right? Yep, next yeah, week. Yeah, it literally starts next, next Monday. Monday. Next Monday, next Monday. So, all right, let's get the people excited about this. What happens? I, I'm, I'm packing my bags. Man, my next guest, Kevin Hill, I think he's actually a speaker at your thing. When he comes on, I ask him if he's already packed. But let's say I'm Kevin Hill. I'm getting ready to come out to this thing. What's in store for me? Yeah, well, the first thing is, like, if you're if you are interested in playing a little golf, we do have a little uh, uh, little golf get together. It's the uh, the the post to pray. It's the one. It's the golf outing that's supposed to be a little bit different. Like no cheating allowed. We actually have to have a handicap index to play. I, I'm certainly, you know, that's the the fun part, you know, of the event where a lot of you can do a lot of social interaction. But really, the the, the main focus of the the broker carrier summit is really trying to bring uh, the the carrier and brokerage world uh, together better. Um, 
as you look at and you've you've been around this industry for a long time, you always get one perspective to one side, one perspective to the other. And, and we're really trying to, to, to bring that together. The hard part is like it's 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 at the very beginning stages, right? We started this uh, we started this last year. We've done a we've done a couple of different events now, um, and, and we're really gaining some positive uh, momentum with bringing up, bringing up a lot of carrier perspectives. I'll focus on the carrier side of things. Uh, a lot of carrier perspectives that we can bring back to the to the brokers and, and trying to help. I'll call it just true broker understand what really goes into operating a truck out there. You know, and, and really trying to develop those open and honest conversations. Now, now, Rob, he said he's he's kind of the, the the carrier side. Why are you bringing these cats and dogs together from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, you think about it from a factoring perspective. You deal with carriers and brokers both uh, on that side, and so we provide a service for carriers, uh, but you also are are working with brokers when it comes to billing and collecting and and doing all those things, and so. Uh, from our perspective, if, if the broker and the carrier have a good relationship, uh, we only succeed when our clients succeed. And, you know, and, and, and part of that is making sure we're doing a good job of doing the billing and collecting work with them. And so in a lot of ways, a, a factoring company is a, kind of like the middleman between uh, brokers and carriers, especially when it comes to the billing and, and collecting piece of that. Wow. So why why KC? Why is Kansas City the epicenter of the event this year? I mean, I know they did like win a Super Bowl. They had that going for them. <laughs> well, we probably really need to defer to Dan on the on the reason for KC, but I think really it comes down to a grassroots approach from how we're getting this this process, this this movement started. Um, we've done Indianapolis and Tampa so far. Uh We've got Kansas City, obviously, coming up next week, another uh, another different venue. So we're, we're trying to move it around throughout the country. And, and the reason for that is for accessibility purposes, because, you know, the, the reality is everybody's watching costs right now. And that doesn't matter if you're on the carrier side or the broker side. So instead of on the broker carrier summit perspective saying, hey, we're in this one destination all the time, we're trying to bring the event closer so the reality is do we want people to attend as many as they can of course you know but if if you've got to make a decision between going to uh, kansas city or a different location that is ultimately uh, closer to you hey that's so that's okay too what we're trying to make sure is we're getting out into the market and really getting in front of the uh folks out there and trying to be as accessible to them as possible now, I, I, I hope this doesn't hurt Kevin Hill's ego, but I was looking on the look the list of speakers and I saw that Wolfie, the mascot of the Kansas City Chiefs, is, is billed above him. Uh, you think we might see like Travis and Taylor there as well? I think the request has been put uh, yeah. in. <laughs> they've, been see, they've been spotted around town, uh, you know, because we, we're, we're based right here in Kansas City. And, you know, uh, hey, we saw on social media the other day, they were both just in the crowd at Coachella out in California. And so maybe, maybe their next stop is to come back here to Kansas city and, and, you know, make a, make an appearance with KC Wolf, uh, at the, at the show. So, uh, you know, we'd love to have them. Uh, so Hey guys, come on down <laughs> here in Overland park, Kansas city. Uh, you know, you, you probably don't live too far away. I mean, I don't know where you live, but come on down. It's, they got private jets. I mean, nothing's far away when you can fly private like that. I'm sure you guys have plenty of airports. I think you know what? If they were at Coachella, I mean, I I would say, listen, on your on your next steps, it's got to be broker carrier summit, it's right? Be broker carrier summit. Now, this is interesting. So you are from you said you're from the factoring side, right, Rob? What do you think? Yeah. Because I gotta imagine people aren't thinking about factoring until they have to pay for stuff. And when they're thinking about factoring, if they're not, if they're paying money, they're angry. If they're getting money, they're happy. Unless it's not enough money. What do these two sides like? What do you hope they know about what you do? Yeah. So, so really, from a factoring perspective, uh, it, it's making sure that the communication is really good between uh, all the all the parties. Uh, and so, I think that gets lost a lot. And and we talk about. The, you know, the issues between brokers and carriers, and that comes down to communication as well. And so same thing from the factoring perspective. We want to have really good communication with the carriers. Uh, we want to have really good communication with the brokers. And then we want to make it super transparent between that. And so uh, if we can figure out better ways to work with brokers, so that's one of our goals with this is to be able to work better with brokers, uh, 
you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Troy and some of these other guys, they understand they hate getting calls from factory companies trying to verify invoices. And so we don't want to do that either. Uh, but I think at the same time, at the end of the day, we're trying to prevent fraud and, and the more things we can do together to, to help that perspective is great. Uh, but make sure that we are doing things in a most efficient possible way to where we're not having to bother each other with, with you know, menial type of tasks. The more uh, technology that we can implement, the more automation uh, that we can put in, in place between uh, us, ourselves, and those guys is better. And, and the same thing from a paperwork perspective with our carriers making it easy for them to submit that paperwork to us. We have a mobile app that does that, uh, that you can just literally take a picture of all your paperwork, uh, Raycon, BOL, POD, all that type of stuff, and send it over. And so uh, we're just trying to make sure that we're bridging the gaps and staying as transparent between all parties. This looks, so April, we're looking at April 22nd to 24th. This is down in... Um this is down in Overland Park, right? Overland Park, Sheraton. Now, what is like, what's sort of the makeup? Like, I was just at Matt's. That had its own vibe. I've been to like the Freightways F3 kind of things. What is like the size and vibe of this particular event? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll grab that one, uh, Rob. Yeah, I mean, from a from a size perspective, you know, we're looking at an attendance. We're, we're going to be around 500 attendees. Um, you know, and as you look at the attendee balance there, we've got, you know, a good mix between... Uh, vendors, which I'll call vendors, tech, uh, freight brokers, and carriers, right? So certainly, you know, from that standpoint, it's a good crowd, but it's certainly not uh, targeted to be like the size of, say, like Rob had just mentioned, we come back from, from TI. TI is an amazing event, and we are absolutely, uh, you know, participants there. But this is more of a, I'll call it a grassroots movement, which we're trying to work with, you know, the TIAs, the uh, you know, the OIDAs, the ATAs, you know, from that perspective. And, and we're really trying to start it from uh, from the very simplest uh, of beginning. So, yeah, I would say, you know, really the goal for this one is, is to be right around 500 attendees, which is, you know, amazing, right, uh, with, with just getting this thing out there. But jumping in on just one back, stepping back one uh, minute, you know, so my background in the industry really is coming up in the freight brokerage world. So... Um, really spent the first half of my career on the on the freight brokerage side of the business. Uh, probably the last 12, 14 years have been as associated with a asset-based brokerage company, the last 10 here at Leonard's Express, where we do both. So really from that mindset, having the opportunity to talk both sides of the fence uh, between the truck side and the brokerage side really gives us a different, or has given me a different viewpoint and why I'm so passionate about participating in this event, because a lot of times neither side knows what the other side is, is thinking or, or truly, truly what their value is that they bring to each other. So really thinking back to that from, from my standpoint, it's, it's, it's been a great experience that I want to share and be willing to share. I'll call it with the greater industry to, to make us better from a longevity standpoint, because the reality is, we don't want any companies going out of business. And I don't care if that's an asset or a brokerage provider. Let's find a healthy economy out there for all of us. I started this show talking about a shutdown of a 70-year-old trucking company. Well, those who want to break bread, they want to come together. They don't want to go out of business. They want to find some carriers. They want to find some brokers to work with. Where do they go to get tickets? They go to, uh, yeah, bro just do a search on brokercarriersummit.com. You can okay. uh, click on the register not register now uh, button in the top right hand corner, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in Kansas City. Very cool. Well, hey guys, thank you so much, and uh, I'm, I'm, I know my next guest will see you over there. So take care, because I got to get over to him. <laughs> All right, sounds great. Thank you. All right, take thank it easy. Care. Hold on, what do we got here? Is this an elsewhere? I don't even know what this one is. Oh, no, I know what this one is. Roll that one. This is a Walmart, a uh, Walmart, uh, a Tesla semi seen hauling a Walmart trailer. Now, it's kind of interesting because typically, as uh, you truckers like to remind me all the time, usually you see them putting a uh, pulling sailboat fuel with those bags of Frito-Lay potato chips. But uh, I don't know what they're pulling for Walmart. There's not a ton of decals on that truck. What are we doing here at Walmart? The guy in this yard's excited, though. Look at that. What do you think? California? Short runs? Definitely not OTR. Let's get a good wave. Not even wave. close. Let's get a good wave. Give him a wave. Yeah. Let's wave to Kevin Hill, owner at Brush Pass Research. It's been too long, Kevin Hill. How you doing, sir? Been doing great, Turner. I love the glass. 
it's, it's, there's too much pollen. I don't know if, if where you are, but the and we got we got the old song playing in the background too. <laughs> the uh, the pollen here, it's like an eleven. I don't know how the chart oh. works, but it said it's eleven point six, and it's red, and it's just really bad, and lots of maple. So like my sinuses just are inflamed right now. Well, there's too many trees in Chattanooga. Trees. Yeah, and around trees. there, there's just too many trees. That's why you had to flee. You had to flee. You're over I in know. Texas now, aren't you, man? Yeah, back in the on the plains. The Plains of Fort Worth. The Plains of Fort Worth. Man, what's Brett? For those who haven't met you, right? Have they haven't met you since you left? They're like, where did Kevin from Put That Coffee Down go? I haven't seen that guy in a while. What's Brush Pass Research? What what the hell have you been up to? I've been up uh, building uh, sales leads and business intel on freight brokers. And that's really for freight tech companies. Anyone selling into freight brokerages, knowing the market, knowing who to talk to, <clears throat> knowing which brokerages should be in their idea customer profile. So been doing that research and... Um, that's allowed me to do research just on the industry in general. It's been fascinating over the last year or so. Well, you have done some very nice research. If you throw this first chart up here, here's what initially got my intention because we talked so much about the Trucking Authority bloodbath and everyone's been looking at that so much, but you've been looking at it from the other side of the equation, what's been happening with freight brokers. And you have discovered that, well, they're facing similar challenges. There has been, there was a huge run up and now there's been a decline. Tell us a little bit what we're looking at and what you have discovered over at Brush Pass. So net on year, right? You take pre-pandemic, say twenty uh, January of twenty twenty to December of twenty twenty three, and you had something like twenty five thousand new MC numbers issued for freight brokerages. Now only about ten thousand of those are still in the operation. So you had this gold rush, kind of like owner operators coming in without a book of business. The market slipped on them, and they're closing up shop. But just in general as well. Year over year, these are year over year numbers here. And what we're seeing is for the last eight months, there's been negative growth, which really haven't ever seen in freight brokerage. And it's double digits now. It's about 10.4% uh, March of 2024 compared to March of 2023. Uh, you're, you're dipping down, you know, and in six months you're, you're coming down, but you're, you're getting about one, one, one and a half percent negative growth in new freight brokerages um, month over month right now. Yeah, I'm looking at these percent of change over time. And in six months, it was negative 6.5. One year, negative 10.4. You'd mentioned that two years, negative 7.4. That's around this time two years ago in 2022 when that freight cliff happened, when suddenly everyone realized yeah. there's way too much capacity in the market, not enough volume to fill it. But the other side of that story is three years ago, compared to three years ago, we're still at plus 10%. Compared to four years ago, we're still at plus 28%. And compared to five years ago, there's still, even with this contraction, if I'm reading this yeah. right, right, there's still 35% yeah. more than in 2019. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that, that comes to that influx of about 25,000 new MC numbers that were issued, right? You still have a net 10,000 more roughly, probably 9,000 more right now than you did pre-pandemic. So you had this huge rush, you know, 15 to 17,000 freight brokerages were in, in existence maybe 18,000 in, in, in 2019. And that jumped to a, a height in November of 2022 of, of what was it? It was, it was right at 30,000. It was 31,000 actually. So you had almost a doubling in the size of freight brokerages. And that shows in the, the industry as a whole that went from about $89 billion in domestic truckload freight uh, controlled by 3PLs by 89 billion in 2019 to 160 billion by 2022. Now, 2023, I, I've been kind of going through numbers right here, and that's fallen down to about 130, 135 billion dollars. So let me ask you something. So with a, like trucking authorities, there's too many trucks capacity. Obviously, that yeah. makes very sense to my trucking mind. What happens on the freight brokerage side, though, when there's, you know, 35 percent extra freight brokerages? What happens to all those businesses? Well, if you think about it, um, you know, they, they just kind of close up shop. But if you think about it, if you have too many brokerages out there, you've been in the sell seat tuner selling 3PL services. What is the, the, the biggest objection always that you have to push through is price. Yeah. So if you have too many freight brokerages out there and too many freight brokers, it's going to be a race to the bottom. So oftentimes cheapest price wins, or that's what we think. And so if you have a lot of freight brokers out there struggling, you're going to find depressed pricing for, for carriers. 
What do we know about the, the size of these? You have a nice chart here that's on the mean and medium employees by freight brokerage size. What is this sort of telling us here, Kevin? This is telling us just uh, by, by tiers. So I, I slice everything into tiers. So you have the top 20, and those are doing over a billion dollars a year. I think there's actually 21 of those now. Uh, large cap, you have about 130, 140 uh, companies, and that includes – no, it actually doesn't include the top 20 – uh, doing about a hundred million to a hundred million, right? And then you have about two hundred mid cap mid caps here, and then about seven hundred growth caps. So if you add all that together, you can get about eleven hundred freight brokerages that are doing ten million dollars or more, and that's going to represent about eighty percent, eighty two percent roughly, of that entire industry, right? So we can talk about having 27,000 freight brokers just out there, but the, that top 1,100 is, is going to do about 80% of the business. So what you see here is kind of the, the mean and average employee counts of that. And you add up all of that and you get to about 125,000 freight brokers booking freight at freight brokerages. Kevin, let me ask you, to freight brokerage grow with the market? This is an interesting chart. Freight brokerage percent of four higher trucking revenue. Break this one down for us. Yeah, so, I, you know, shippers have, you know, back when I got in the business about 10, 11 years ago, you didn't really want to say you're a broker uh, because <laughs> that meant that you're charging a premium and that everything go wrong. But the, the market's really shifted to, to, to doing – you know, shippers handling freight through 3PLs. And a lot of the, the large trucking companies now are not trucking companies. They're a full stop, kind of like the Walmarts, right? That they have a little bit of everything. They have 3PL services, they have warehousing. So you've seen this percentage of the truckload volumes handled by 3PLs or freight brokerages increase, you know, since 2015, but you see that during the pandemic, you went from about 15% to 25% over the last five years. So we, we talk about logistics really being changed through the pandemic, and we're seeing you know the, the after effects of this right here. And I think that's going to climb higher, probably at a compounded annual growth rate of seven to eight percent. Interesting. Why do you why do you uh, see it high? Why do you see it moving at that rate? Because I, I think uh, you know. You, the, the, the barriers between an asset base and non-asset base are blurring because all the, the large asset based companies now have non-asset based divisions. So I think that um, that, that is a really good growth metric right there. And I think that you, you have a lot of 3PLs coming up or freight brokerages uh, that are pure plays that do tremendous jobs with technology, right? So it's technology forward, being able to integrate with customers, being able to um, ease the flow of communications and that, that project management of having trucks on, on the fleet. Brokerages now have the tools to, to really be able to, to handle large volumes of business. Interesting. You see AI having a big impact this uh, this decade? I, I think so. Uh, what, what exactly it pans out to be, I, I'm not really sure. But I, I think if you take all this data and, and be able to, to kind of manage that in, in a way that – is efficient. That's good, but figuring out what's what was useful data and what's not is is still a struggle. And AI might be able to, to help out with that. Kevin, I th I think with a lot of the AI stuff, it's like it, it's a smoke screen to just like send jobs overseas anyway. Like a room, like like with that, like that the, I, the grab and go store is just a bunch of people watching on on monitors. So I'm not sure if it's just an excuse for that efficiency, but either way, it may cost some jobs. But who's moving the loads, Kevin? Let's look at the largest 1,000 freight brokers and their median loads per day. Show us this chart, and Kevin, what do we got here? This is a this is an interesting one. It, it is, you know. So so you take those top 20 and and, and pro probably anyone doing 500 million dollars and above. Uh, that top 5% of, of brokerages, and they're doing about 2,000 loads a day, you know, each one of them. If you come down to, you know, say 10, $15 million brokerage, they're doing about 40 to 50 loads per day. So so what you see, what, what this really shows and, and other charts that I have is that while there are still 27, 28,000 freight brokerages with active MC numbers, it is very highly concentrated in, in say that top 5% or that top 10% of freight brokerages out there. 
are doing essentially all the business. So we, we can say there's 27,000 freight brokerages out there, but if we were looking at loads and dollars and, and kind of market share, you know, only about two to 3,000 of them are actually controlling the market. And once you go a step above that, about, say, 7%, are really controlling the market. And I, I think um, I, I was going through gross revenues just before I jumped on here, and it, it's, it looks like about 75%. So let's just say 70%. 70% of the gross revenues generated through freight brokerage are done through those, those brokerages that are $100 million plus per year in gross revenue. Hmm. So it's very highly concentrated at the top. Kevin, what are you what are you talking about next week? By the way, at, at that broker carrier summit, what's uh, what's your big speech going to be on all this stuff that we just talked about here? Yeah, a little bit about that, and I, I'm doing a lot of sessions on strengthening the the relationship building between brokers and carriers. I did that in Tampa um, back in October. It's a, it's a great conference, and you know what Troy and Robert are saying is that it's very grassroots. Everyone is very approachable. Uh, at the conference, it's really focused on small businesses. So like like fleets of maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 trucks and brokers just doing about 10 million, um, 5 million to, to say 25, 30 million dollars. And everyone is very vocal. You won't come to a conference where the audience is as vocal during the presentations as the Broker Carrier Summit. And it was fun. It was fun. Like we went to a group therapy session. Um, through that. So it's, it's, <laughs> Anger it's well worth doing. Yeah. <laughs> Anger management. There's going to be some golf there too. I don't, I don't know what your handicap is these days. Kevin, you travel a lot for sales. Where is the glo the grossest place you've ever taken a shower? The grossest place I've ever taken a shower um, is, is probably like a, a Motel 6 in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh my God! I was gonna so go with the that, same thing, man. I, I was gonna go with the, like those little <laughs> hotels, the ones you just drive up to and you go in. The film, like that, is on the floor in those, and oh, a lot yeah. of those, like they still have like smoking in them stuff. So it, it smells like a chain smoker lived there, and there's just film on everything. That there is there, and that was about probably like 25, 30 years ago, uh, twenty five years ago, probably, and uh, it was it was just run down. It smelled of. You know, the, the, the hotel did and that part of town town smelled as well, kind of like Chemical Alley uh, there, there in Baton Rouge. But it was it was horrible. Well, you know, they have these right here. Roll this video. They got these truck stop showers for drivers. But do you think this could work for like the traveling freight broker salesperson, especially if you end up at a Motel 6? I, I think it tent. could. Audio listeners, there's a tent I, I here. And this guy, he's, just, some. he's got a hose end that's like he just sticks it in a bucket. Right, and he shoots himself in his little, his little portable thing. A lot of I asked the truck driving community what they thought. Justin Martin said cold showers. George said in the summer I do a gallon shower, swimming trunks, shower shoes, lather up and rinse off. So he just like gets himself wet, puts a little dawn on himself, and dumps a gallon. Joe Seppi says for what? I'm a flat better. Like when do you ever shower? <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of, of the, the, the weekly showers when I was growing up in Oklahoma, you know? I mean, you just get out in the yard and, and spray That's yourself you down with the hose. Mom just grabs the hose and uh, shoots you off, throws a little soap at you? Yeah. Gets you behind yeah. the ears? That's, uh, that's how you did it. Nick Wilson yeah. said if he saw someone using that, he would tip it over with you inside. Well, that's not very Nick. That's not very nice, Nick. <laughs> Freaking jerk. Kevin, lightning question right here. Uh, is this good sales advice or not? Tell your customer you're under a lot of pressure to close this deal this week, and what can they do to help you? Should you ever pull that one out? Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> that's horrible. That's just desperation. That's desperate. That, that means, oh, I can just, I'm going to negotiate my way all the way down to the basement. Yeah, it's horrible advice. Yeah, the value proposition is no longer that you're going to help my company. It's that suddenly I'm going to help you not get like fired. And now also you are like an at-risk employee. Like if I, if you even make, are you going to make it to the quarter after this? Do I need a new rep? That's the first thing I think. <laughs> well, Kevin, I want the first thing people to think is what's cool with Brush Pass Research. So where do I send them to? Go to brushpassresearch.com or brushpassresearch.blog. That's where all, all my research is. So you can check that out, but and you can create a free login and, and search around the database of leads. Kevin, good seeing you. Can't wait to see you again in person. Thank you so much for stopping by. What the truck, I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you all of, all of you for tuning in. If you're on Sirius Road Dog, 
Uh, Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking, channel 146 at 5 p.m. You're listening on the podcast. If you like the podcast, look up What the Truck wherever you get your podcast, Freight Waves TV, FreightWavesTV.com, or go to our Freight Waves YouTube channel for the entire playlist. And of course, connect with me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. Take care and don't be a stranger.